Hello, everyone. Private sector innovations and technologies for disaster risk management session. The session that we are having today. I think this is a part of a series. The first one was on the 26th of May, and it was a very specific session about the innovations in Turkey. And today we are here with the CBI Secretariat and with their help. In fact, and now uh, we have speakers from Turkey and from other countries as well. We are very happy uh, with their presence. Thank you very much in advance. Now about our event, I would like to give you some short information and then I would like to give the floor to my dear colleagues. Well, in fact, after a few presentations, we will be speaking in more detail uh, about a project that is the Business and Climate Resilience Project. So this e event is an activity under this project. And in fact, uh, we are going to listen to Iram Oral Kayaji, president of P4G platform, and then we'll be talking about the details of the project. We have a speaker from Yamata International, Mr. Yusuf Zahid Gündoğdu. And also from GSMA, we have Mr. Isaac Kwame with us, and also from OCHA, uh, Center for Humanitarian Data, we have Antonin with us. After listening to the dear speakers, in fact, then we would like to get the questions of your dear participants, uh, because we also have uh, Pro Associate Professor Murat Tiriakiol, a consultant of the project here available and online in this session, would like to have a joint discussion uh, uh, session uh, here with you so that we can create more space uh, uh, for discussions about innovations. And the uh, program coordinator, CBI program coordinator, Karim Albayar, will be giving the closing remarks today. And again from CBI Secretary, my dear colleague, uh, Riza Nerek is the co-host uh, of the session with me. So in fact, in order to enrich this uh, story, I'd like to pass the floor to you, in fact, my dear colleague. Thanks a lot, Sumai, and good day, colleagues. My name is Riza Neri, the Network Coordination Specialist of the Connecting Business Initiative, which is a joint program by the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, or OCHA, and the United Nations Development Program, or UNDP. We're very, very excited to have you join us today for this session, which aims to showcase concrete examples and global best practices on the use of innovation and technologies for and with the private sector when it comes to disaster management. And to formally start our session today, I would like to call on Ms. Irem Oral Kayajik, the president of the Business for Goals platform, or B4G, to welcome us all to today's session. The floor is yours, Ms. Irem. Thank you, Riza. Thanks for the introduction. Değerli katılımcılar, CBI Ağa ve Sekretaryası'nın kıymetli distinguished participants, distinguished representatives of the CBI network and secretary, I extend my basic as to each and every one of you as the Business for Goals platform since our foundation in order to add to the disaster resilience of businesses, we have been working a lot. Of course, this has always been a critical topic for us and as an indicator of this importance, in fact, uh, we have been working uh, together with the technical and financial support of CBI network so far. As you know, our uh, planet is struggling with the climate crisis that we inflicted and induced. And in addition to the earthquakes, there are many other climate-based uh, uh, disaster risks. Uh, the globe is warming up and there are, uh, there are imbalances in mid-seasons and now the climate uh, issue is not an issue of future but is an issue of today and uh, our future. In fact, if we continue like this, we will be continue stealing from the life cycle of both the organic and inorganic uh, uh, structures. So adaptation and mitigation are important processes that would like to run together. In fact, uh, some uh, practice in fact may help the planet breathe. And in order to strengthen them, you know, now we 
initiate partnerships as stated in sustainable development goal number 17. And in fact, there are many uh, sectors and experts working for this transformation to generate information and practices. And uh, in fact, as to the B4G platform, we were founded in order to uh, uh, have sustainability in Turkey and sustainability for the business uh, in Turkey. Tusiad and Turkonfed has a very uh, broad grassroots and tens of thousands of companies are brought together and many associations are uh, brought together. And in fact, it, there is also the UNDP's wide global knowledge and uh, field capacity and network. So all these elements are brought together uh, with the human resources, intellectual capacity and financial resources available. And there's also the CBI, Connecting Business Initiative, and, uh, you know, in 2016, there was the World Humanitarian Summit. It was initiated then. And in fact, they are working in order to transform the way of responding to natural and human induced disasters and complicated emergencies. To UNDP Turkey, in fact, uh, initiated in November 2018, uh, in fact, uh, some efforts in order to create a Turkish network of uh, CBI. Uh, in fact, uh, our aim is to create a win-win situation. And uh, as the first step, uh, as you know, uh, would like to address the issue of earthquakes, climatic uh, events, and uh, many other complicated emergencies, just like the Syrian crisis. And uh, th there is a very quickly evolving risk profile in Turkey. And in coping with this, in order to engage private sector, it is necessary to create the appropriate technology. And that is why we prepared a report titled Resilience in SMEs, New Risks, New Priorities. And then we uh, carried out many other uh, uh, works. My uh, uh, colleagues will be informing you about the B4G's efforts related to uh, disaster resilience. Uh, but uh, although they will be talking about the details, I'd like to highlight a few points for your attention. 99% of enterprises in Turkey are SMEs, and just like mentioned in sturdy SME report, 80% of the SMEs affected by the disasters close down, and 15% of the remaining if they go bankrupt in the first 24 months. You know, just this piece of data shows us the priority. Uh, so Turkish economy cannot really tolerate source where uh, losses, irreversible losses. We need to be ready for the disasters and we need to start a planning as early as possible. Climate crisis is a global risk and it is necessary to learn from the experience of other countries, uh, which risks are there we are facing that these may be different governance structures and response capacities may be different that doesn't matter so much uh, but you know as part of cbi network uh, in fact uh, we are also learning uh, from cbi network uh, the necessary knowledge and experience that will help us uh, support the relevant sectors since October 2021, uh, we have been uh, running our project uh, about climate crisis-based disasters. We have been running with the support of CBI Network, and we are now happy that we are organizing this event again with the extensive efforts of CBI Secretary. Thank you very much. On the 26th of May, we had another event where we talked about the innovations in Turkey. That was a nice reminder, I guess. So I would like to thank UNDP, OCHA, Turkonfat, who, were, uh, who have always been our stakeholders on this journey. And also I would like to thank my dear colleagues in B4G and CBI Network Secretary. Thank you very much for always being with us. I hope this event will be a very fruitful one. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Iram Kayacek. Thank you very much for your nice greetings. Uh, in fact, uh, she referred to the beginning of all this story, all this journey. Now, I would like to talk about the current state of affairs, what we have been doing under this project. Well,
Let me see full screen. Yes, thank you. I'm speaking in Turkish, uh, but of course there is interpretation in English and my slides will be in English. Maybe it will be easier for our foreign guests to follow. Well, very briefly, I would like to talk about Business for Goals platform. In fact, as Ms. Iram Kayacek elaborated, this uh, is a tripartite structure. The before G platform, however, is not limited to these three organizations. In fact, I think this is the most important characteristics of before G. So when you look at the structure of the platform, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, uh, organ the representatives of organizations who have adopted the principles of the platform, in fact, are always welcome. So anyone who would like to uh, cooperate, in fact, uh, uh, can be a part of the platform. Uh, so other representatives of different organizations, uh, uh, in fact, uh, can always uh, join uh, us. So we are, in fact, think to thank platform we think, we filter all these ideas, and then we go into action. So this event is another indicator of this. In fact, we have been working on the axis of sustainable development goals. You know, uh, we would like to improve the efficiency uh, and would like to improve and develop partnerships. We would like to do more advocacy. We would like to raise awareness in the fulfillment of SDGs. You see the working areas. We have three main working areas. The first one is related to climate change and disaster resilience, which is also the topic of the day. We will be talking about this project. Uh, we will be talking about our story under this working area. But of course, we have other program areas, just like preparing the enterprises for future. And also we have inclusive growth. If you are wondering about what we are doing in these two other working areas, you, we call you uh, to visit the website of uh, B4G. So dear Gamze, maybe you can put the link in the chat box so that the uh, participants can later on go and visit our website. As you heard from Ms. In 2018, with the uh, establishment of CBI Turkey Network, then uh, first we prepared a report in order to show the needs, and this is also available on our website. And then in early 2020, in Istanbul, we organized a workshop under the theme of. Uh, Istanbul earthquake. Uh, so infrastructure sector representatives and private sector representatives in fact came together to discuss what would happen in case of a disaster, particularly an earthquake in Istanbul and uh, what kind of functional, uh, uh, functionality would be ensured. That was discussed by all these partners. Well, in fact, our initial pieces of work related to disaster resilience were related to uh, earthquakes mostly. First, there was the NS earthquake, and uh, we ha had a team that went to field in order to collect data. Then in uh, October 2020, there was Izmir earthquake. And then we were interested in SMEs, small scale SMEs, in order for them to have business sustainability. Uh, in fact, uh, we uh, they needed some emergency uh, action plan training, and we provided this training. And under the leadership of Tusiad and Tukovet, and with the contribution of Sedefed and B4G, we uh, uh, studied an Istanbul earthquake scenario. Uh, we had a series of workshops and we created a report with the learnings from these workshops. In fact, when the pandemic started, we also considered it as a disaster. So CBI Secretariat has been providing us the uh, technical and financial support. And in Turkey, we wanted to understand what was the impact of pandemic on the SMEs. And the uh, first and most comprehensive uh, survey was conducted by us all throughout 2020. In fact, the questionnaires were repeated periodically in order to feel the pulse uh, of economy 
and the social aspect. Uh, in fact, we wanted to cover the whole impacts in social, uh, economic, uh, and gender uh, uh, topics. And based on the needs, we organized another series of webinars. In the scope of this project, we also had another pillar related to PPE manufacturers, the personal protective equipment manufacturers, in fact, uh, uh, were there uh, uh, during that period. However, it was problematic to find and access the reliable ones. And we created a list of reliable vendors of PPE. And another project of our platform uh, is financed by the Japanese government. It was related to COVID-19 resilience. And in the manufacturing of PPE, uh, in fact, we held identification and formulation of standards. Uh, so uh, a one-to-one -one consultation for the manufacturers and capacity building training uh, programs were provided by us. So we started with the earthquakes and then there was COVID-19 and, you know, we had the, the European Green Deal and the uh, Paris Climate Agreement, but there were some other events in Turkey, extreme climatic events and wildfires. So we wanted to improve the resilience of the business world in response to climate change. So today we are having our discussions on a specific project, which you see here, Business Climate Resilience Project. We had many activities under this project, but I think we can categorize them into three groups. So first, we have dialogue environments, and today's event is a part of this pillar. So your active participation is very valuable. Awareness raising seminars and capacity building trainings are the other events that we organized. You see all the activities in detail here throughout the project timeline. In October 2021, we launched the project and then we held two seminars. And uh, today you see Mr. Murat Tiriaki, this professor uh, led uh, those seminars. We had a training course, uh, the uh, first two days, in fact, uh, were open to all the business representatives, uh, uh, regardless of sectors. So it was about the uh, uh, climate dependence and climate resilience. And as of the third day, uh, agri-food sector was chosen as the focal uh, uh, theme. And currently, you are listening to the second technology seminar today. And in fact, as I said before, we had another session on the 26th of May. That it was about the uh, Turkish case and its recording will be uploaded on our website. And in fact, all the relevant past work will be available uh, under the relevant temp on our website. Later on, we will have some visits in Ankara because we would like to uh, uh, explain to decision makers what we have been doing under this project and we would like to uh, produce a permanent uh, output uh, uh, and it will be a toolkit it will be published please stay tuned uh, they will be available for you and in fact in the scope of this project we have been conducting all these works and, and these slides in fact are giving the details uh, in fact we will put this presentation uh, and upload it onto our website i don't want to go into too much detail but just to help you remember, I would like to talk about the European Green Deal. Uh, I would refer to this as well as the Paris Climate Agreement. So for G platform is also working to support the businesses in these fields. And we have this big program, Green Transformation of Turkish Industrial Program. And uh, in fact, the business organizations mainly and also other participants who can speak about the needs of the business uh, are our participants. Uh, so uh, 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 carbon border and uh, carbon border adjustment and green uh, circular economy are the two topics that we're working on. So we're trying to create some solutions in these fields. And this is a very significant dialogue environment that we have created. 
Also, with the climate crisis, we have been running this prominent uh, uh, initiative, Second Circle Economy Week of Turkey. The first one uh, took place uh, uh, in uh, uh, 2021, last year, and we organized the second week this year. And we spent one whole week speaking about circular economy, and uh, the, that is a very prominent series of uh, events. That is the end of my presentation. Now, if you have any questions, uh, please type your questions in uh, the chat box, or whenever relevant, you can just raise your hand and uh, give your questions. So this is uh, applicable throughout the whole uh, session. Now, this item is done, and I would like to give the floor to our first speaker now, Mr. Yusuf Zahid Gündoğdu, representative of Miyota International Turkey. So I'd like to give the floor to him right now. Mr. Yusuf Gündoğdu, in fact, worked in Japan for seven years uh, in the design of certain structural uh, uh, projects and uh, in fact he has a master's degree in construction technique data banks uh, hospitals coastal uh, and sea structures and energy consuming critical structures and innovative uh, retrofitting or his fields of expertise is an expertise of more than 30 years would like to learn him a lot it's a great joy to have you here mr yusuf said gundodo the floor is yours thank you very much miss my kardesh now let me share my screen I think you can see my screen right now. Uh, would, you please, would you please make it full screen? Yes. Yes, it's done. Thank you. Go ahead. First of all, thank you very much for this um, uh, very, very interesting session. Uh, in fact, uh, I was planning to uh, make my presentation in English, but uh, considering uh, the most of the participants are Turkey, uh, I better. I think I better um, submit my presentation in Turkey if you don't mind. Uh, Hello, I'd like to extend you my best regards. In this presentation, I'll be talking about innovative solutions on disaster risk management. So what are the solutions in order to raise awareness? So my main aim in this presentation will be to raise awareness. So very briefly, I will be talking about and introducing you Miyamoto International, and then I will talk about earthquake risk management, uh, the available structures, and what are the innovative methods that we have been um, Employing, and I will compare innovative methods uh, versus conventional methods. And then I will mention a few case studies which were implemented in Istanbul and Turkey. So I will try to add to your awareness in this topic. Miyamoto International was established in 1946 in Sacramento, California, USA. So it's a USA company. The company uh, specializes in high performance earthquake engineering. Miyamoto International is a global structural engineering and disaster risk reduction firm. And it provides resilience expertise around the world. This is the geographical presence of the company, uh, uh, the, the use of the global presence of the company, especially in the areas with a high earthquake risk, the company has some strategic uh, locations. You see red dots, and uh, they refer to a magnitude of seven and over. Uh, and the red lines, in fact, indicate the main fault lines. You can understand the critical locations by looking at this map. So when we are managing the earthquake 
risk, there's a certain perception. By the way, this picture shows you Los Angeles Airport. This is a critical premises, a critical facility. So we wonder, uh, 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 or let's say airport management, in fact, wondered what is uh, the current situation of the airport in the face of earthquake risk. They requested to work with Miyamoto International to understand the risk. Uh, so most of the perception is limited to the security of life. But you know, that cannot be the whole perception, especially if it is a critical facility. Post-earthquake sustainability is a very important concept. That is why each of these structural elements you see in the picture should be evaluated from a different perspective than the security of life only. After the earthquake, which units or structural elements may remain closed? That's an important question. And how long will they remain closed? That is the approach. And you see the color coding. After a very comprehensive study, this presentation was prepared, by the way, a yellow color, you see the structures that will remain or may remain closed for less than five weeks. The green color shows the potential to remain closed for less than five days, but the red color shows the structures that will remain closed for more than five weeks and that need early action. So here's a message that we would like to give. The post-earthquake sustainability topic, in fact, is an important concept for essential facilities. Uh, so if we can say, an airport is a critical structure. What about a hospital, for example, if there has been a surgical operation going on at that moment, it is necessary to go on with the operation in a few hours. Or if we are speaking about an industrial manufacturing facility, then it's important. Uh, what is the sustainability of performance? You see this chart here, in this facility, you see the control damage and life safety performance level. That is the level. However, maybe this part is more important because this is minimum damage and immediate occupancy performance level. That's maybe a more urgent issue for the structure. So here, availing myself of this opportunity, I would like to talk about some more innovative approaches. And retrofitting the structures may be a critical topic later on uh, because uh, the owners, property owners or business owners, in fact, when they uh, see that okay, a retrofitting will come with uh, 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 downtime. They just may change uh, their mind. But now you know there are different techniques, and these techniques have been developed during the last three decades. Now I have a video of one minute, and here you see a hydraulic suspension system, mostly in motorbikes. This is used as a shock absorber. And these, in fact, uh, can be put into a frame uh, to uh, columns and to beams, and it is used as a diagonal element. Uh, you see on the right-hand side, you see the shock absorbers are already installed and assembled with the frame. And you see the movement of the systems. And these are the potential configurations in which you can use these shock absorbers in the frames. And that can be a multi-story uh, structure as well, as you can see in this uh, diagram. So 
here you see their actual utilization in real construction. This uh, is a historical uh, hotel in Sacramento. And in, you, you see in these parts of this building, it was not necessary to close down anything. And uh, they just, we just installed these elements uh, in relevant uh, portions of the building with a very short you know, downtime. It was possible to install this and use this as a solution. Now, a summary at a glance here. It, this is not the only solution. The, uh, you see at the very top, you see fluid viscous dampers, but in the center of the slide, you see another option, friction dampers. But there is also a third option. This is about base isolation. You put them at the foundation of the building, just like you see on the left-hand side, post-earthquake sustainability uh, reaches a very high level with this solution. In the next slide, you will see their real-life implementations, maybe uh, helping you better understand these solutions. So this is a viaduct in Mejidiko district of Istanbul. On the left hand side, you see the column uh, before retrofitting. You see the detail between the column and the slab. This is a connection point. Uh, uh, but here, after insertion of the isolator, you see what happened. In the past, it was fixed connection, but then we used hydraulics in order to lift up the slab. So, uh, we created no downtime and the traffic was not blocked and it was possible to retrofit the viaduct. It is a very important example because the, the Director General of Highways of Turkey in fact ordered this project before they got awareness uh, uh, about this and they would block the traffic and then they understood it would be a huge chaos because of the blocked uh, road and traffic. But then after uh, uh, they became aware of this new solution, uh, uh, they really wanted to use this solution and they eliminated this uh, huge traffic jam uh, problem. Now, a comparison between innovative and conventional methods. As you saw in the previous slide, without intervening in the foundation, just like you give local anesthetics to a patient, you can absorb the seismic impact on the structure. On the right hand side, you see a conventional implementation. So you see the intervention uh, elements and you see the chaotic situation that you are going to create with the conventional method you are going to implement and there will be some significant downtime and it is inevitable in a conventional method like this. Now in this picture, you see too much instrumentation. Uh, uh, this is a facility that is filled with so many instruments and electronics. So you cannot retrofit this facility with conventional methods. So the business owners or the property owners, in fact, uh, if they don't have the relevant awareness, probably they would think of demolishing the whole facility and rebuilding a new one. Probably they would think it would be their only option. However, there are some available solutions. You see this uh, implementation is from Turkey. You see another shock absorber here, the damper as we call it. And the general principle is here not to strengthen the whole structure, but to uh, uh, install shock absorber at the critical points of the structure and the seismic energy uh, acting on the structure will be damped and absorbed. This is the innovative approach that we uh, adopt. Now let's look at here. You see a manufacturing facility with a lot of instrumentation, with conventional methods. It's, I can say it's almost 
impossible to retrofit this facility. And uh, here uh, you see our innovative approach in place. The shock absorbers uh, were uh, located at suitable points, and the seismic impact on the structure is lessened here. Now, this video is an example video from Japan. In 2011, in fact, the earthquake with the biggest magnitude of the history was taking place. And in Tokyo, uh, the high buildings, in fact, were recorded in a video. Uh, Tokyo was a bit far away from this uh, epicenter. You see in this video a structure that is not directly affected by the earthquake. And this uh, structure had base isolation, by the way. This is the close up. Uh, there is displacement of one to two meters in other structures, but you see this specific one does not move because this one only has the base isolation uh, solution. I wanted to show you because you know that was the building which was not moving in the previous video and, and uh, at the base of this building uh, you, the isolators that you see here were already installed and with the help of these isolators in fact uh, the structure was preserved so uh, in fact this structure has been used as a school uh, as a teaching facility so there are the dormitories uh, uh, in the upper uh, stories and uh, the students were uh, uh, at a lesson uh, uh, in fact during the earthquake and they were not affected i'm sorry i'm interrupting your presentation and uh, in fact we received many messages uh, uh, from the participants and interpreters so your voice really has very poor quality do you have any other solutions i don't know maybe you can play with the microphone to improve the quality. How is it now? Not really. Not a big positive change. We should go on uh, talking. Uh, 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 in fact, many people were complaining that it was very difficult for you to hear you. But anyway, I think it's better that we continue. Sorry, I had to uh, intervene, you, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Yusuf, because I received so many messages. Okay, maybe I can try speaking louder. I was just showing you that previous video because, you know, I was pointing at this building, which was not moving. And with the help of the isolators at the base of this building, in fact, the uh, pupils uh, that were at uh, a training session didn't feel the earthquake at all. So with the help of this uh, technology, the hospitals uh, can be operational right after an earthquake. And this is the last line I'm about to finish. Uh, this shows an application in Turkey. You see a, a very huge hospital, a mega hospital, and uh, also uh, uh, that was constructed with base isolators. And in this picture, you see uh, nine blocks. In fact, uh, they're all floating on one single diaphragm. And for post earthquake sustainable performance, you can see uh, uh, 
it gets a star because it will be available right after the earthquake. I'd like to thank you very much for your uh, attention. I hope this technical problem was not blocking you from hearing me. Thank you very much. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. And now, Moving on from hard infrastructure interventions um, as applied to earthquake scenarios, let's now move on to how critical infrastructure sectoral players such as mobile network operators um, work with different partners, particularly in the humanitarian sector. So allow, allow me to introduce our next speaker who is Mr. Isaac Kwame, and uh, he is the Director of uh, Strategic Partnerships for the Mobile for Humanitarian Innovation Program. In this role, he is responsible for building and managing partnerships between mobile network operators and the humanitarian sector for Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East and North Africa region. Isaac has over 19 years of senior level experience in the humanitarian and developed development sector. And prior to joining GSMA, Isaac worked for NetHope as Global Programs Director for Disaster Management and Crisis Informatics and, and provides leadership, oversight and execution of the organization's global humanitarian operations program, including emergency preparedness and response efforts. Um, Isaac, the floor is yours. We are very pleased to have you with us today. Over to you. Thank you, Riza. Um, first of all, can you see my screen? I'm trying to present, to share my screen. If uh, Yusuf Bey could stop sharing his screen, um, I think uh, I'm still seeing his screen from my end. There you go. Thank you. Let me try to do that now. Are you able to see my screen? Not yet. Okay. How about now? Unfortunately, no, so. All right, then um, to help minimize the issue with uh, screen sharing, I can just talk through my screen directly to all participants here, if that's all right with everyone. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so today, um, first of all, sorry for the screen share issues. Um, mainly used to um, uh, Microsoft Teams for some of these uh, technical um, working from home technologies. So sorry for that. Um, yes, as by the introduction that Risa shared with um, everyone, uh, yeah, I work for the GSMA Mobile for Humanitarian Innovation Program, um, which has one one big vision which is accelerating the delivery of an impact of digital humanitarian assistance. And uh, while this vision is very broad, we have taken three ways of um, trying to get this vision off the ground. We approach it through advocacy, by enabling uh, a more enabling um, uh, operational environment, working with the regulators and the government. Uh, we do it through thinking, which is pulling out all the insight that will inform our work at the grassroots. And the thirdly, through the doing bit of it, which is separated into two. One is through enabling innovation fund, giving grant of cash money to partners such as tech partners or mobile network operators or humanitarian partners. Sorry, the sign is really so in my eyes today. Uh, for some reason, it's very sunny in London today. Um, as well as um, bringing startups together 
influencing them to bring solutions that are geared toward addressing the issues of adoption of mobile or, or any technology enabled solution for humanitarian assistance. And the other bit of that is through strategic partnership. And this is through long-term well-informed uh, partnership and a common goal. It could be addressing issues around digital identity or um, issues around use of mobile money as an enabler or a modality to distributing cash to after a humanitarian disaster has happened or during the normal time. Um, and we've seen this working well because A, there is provision of seed money through innovation funds that catalyzes innovative solution, but also through strategic partnerships whereby some of the solutions that we are advocating or implementing at the grassroots are solutions that are already in existence. They need a buy-in from humanitarian partners. They need to get users on board so that the scale up of adoption can increase. And so far through these approaches, we have multiple portfolio of projects across the globe. Uh, while the focus has been mainly um, a low income, low and middle income countries, uh, we're seeing more and more this is also coming toward um, the well-developed countries such as during uh, the solution that we deploy now during this uh, Ukraine crisis. Through our global impact, we are following five key thematic area of innovative solutions. And this is mobile enabled utilities through um, such as uh, use of uh, clean energy within humanitarian context. Um, focus also on food security and climate change. Uh, looking at a solution that are mobile enabled, technology enabled that are helping addressing and mitigating against the issue around climate change. We look at digital identity which is especially in the displaced community when a uh, community are moved from one country to the next, how can they maintain their identity that can be linked to them directly? In many cases, this links directly to the aid that is provide, being provided by them and mobile or technology partners have a critical piece to, to, to play in this case. Um, the, the fourth one is gender and inclusivity. In many ways, we've seen adoption of mobile-enabled solution or if just mobile devices is very much um, in some context or in various country contexts looked as a, um, a male pushed to and adoption of mobile devices by female or by women is still very low. And while it's in our experience, we've seen that in many cases, women are the head of the household but then when the adoption or inclusion of them in adopting or owning mobile devices is impeded just because of their gender, that creates a displaced um, scale up of uh, adoption of any technology process. So we've been pushing to that. And the last one is mobile financial services. As we know, um, many countries, especially the low income countries, banking is a luxury that many of these po uh, population cannot afford because they do not have the capital to open a bank account. As such, mobile enabled solution, especially the mobile money, has provided a huge potential for financial inclusion for those communities that are underserved. And mobile solution, as well as other technologies such as the fintechs and financial enabled services, are playing a critical role. All our work are uh, guided by three uh, by five humanitarian trends that we've noticed that can be addressed by a mobile digital solution. And these include cash and voucher assistance, disaster preparedness and response, uh, forced displacement, food insecurity, and also addressing the climate change. These five thematic areas are underpinned by three programmatic uh, principles that we look at, and these include digital and ethics and data protection, inclusive and dignified aid, and the localized and being accountable to those that we serve. Um, under the UN Millennium Goal, localization has played a key role. We cannot push technology from the north down to the south and accept, accept it, expect the pickup to be much higher. Some of the innovative solutions in the humanitarian side, in the humanitarian sector, 
sector need to be um, driven uh, locally with support from um, global partners. And that is what will enable huge uptake and also starting to see that technology is playing a critical role in the lives of those who are impacted by the various disasters. Real quickly, I'm gonna to touch on one other um, initiative that was launched since 2015, and this is the mobile humanitarian, the GSMA Humanitarian Connectivity Charter, which currently is uh, composed of nine, 159 mobile network operators and operational in 111 countries. And the charter itself is designed as what we're talking about, similar to CBI, but focusing on um, strengthening access to communication and information to those that are affected by uh, different crises in order to reduce the loss of life and also positively contribute to the effort of humanitarian response. And this is driven by the mobile network operators sector and the humanitarian sector. And the charter has three key principles to enhance coordination within and among net mobile network operators during, um, before, during, and after disaster. So preparedness, to response, to transition, uh, to scale and standardize preparedness and response activities across the industry to enable a more predictable responses. We've seen case of this working in the early warning system that we were deployed with uh, Digicel in Haiti during the Hurricane Mary of 2017. The population were notified through bl uh, blast messages of to be aware of what's coming and to take precautions that are needed. And the third one is to strengthen partnerships between the mobile industry, government, and the humanitarian sector, because the three sectors really have to work together in uh, to be able to address some of the challenging situation. Without that collaboration at the local level between the, the business industry, the private sector, government, and the, and, and the humanitarian or development um, organization, um, nothing really will take place. We can be talking about this until yesterday they say this the situation will still to be the same as such it's great to see that cbi is putting all of this together because i think the force of collaborative effort is the only way we can really start to make a difference out there uh thank you thank you very much isaac and even without the presentation slides let me tell you the message was very clear so thank you for walking us through the examples and also emphasizing that the application of innovation and technologies, in your case, mobile-based solutions, um, really rely on uh, good partnerships between the government, the business community, and other civil society actors. So thank you very much, Isaac. Now, I turn over to our next speaker, uh, and he is Mr. Anthony Burke, who is the Humanitarian Data Exchange Community Manager with the Auches Center for Humanitarian Data. He is joining us from Bangkok, Thailand today and is hosted by the Ocha Regional Office for the Asia and the Pacific. His role is to support data providers and data users on the humanitarian data exchange and make sure that people sharing and in using humanitarian data are getting the most out of the open data platform. We're very happy that you are here with us today, Tony, and um, the floor is yours. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> One sec, just setting up my PowerPoint. Okay, you can hear me now and you can see the, the first uh, slide, right? Just to confirm. Okay, great. That's correct. Oh, perfect. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Tony. I'm the HDX Community Manager and I work for Ultra's Center for Humanitarian Data. Uh, so today I'm just going to walk us through uh, the work of the Center and HDX. I'll talk a little bit about the HDX data grid and I'll showcase some of the data explorers and dashboards created by the center team when we have quality data that's public and available to use. 
So the Center for Humanitarian Data is based in The Hague in the Netherlands, and it's managed by UN OCHA. So OCHA is part of the United Nations Secretariat and is responsible for bringing together humanitarian actors to ensure a coherent response to emergencies. So the Center for Humanitarian Data was established in 2017, and now we have a global and growing team. So the center team is, is spread across the globe. So what began with a few staff in New York and Geneva has now expanded out into a global team with colleagues recently added now in Dakar, in Nairobi, Bangkok and Jakarta. So the mission of the center is to increase the use and impact of data in humanitarian response. So we want the humanitarian system that's more data driven. We want people to be able to quickly find the data that they need. This leads then to be better analysis and insights of an emergency and hopefully leads to better action taken by humanitarian leadership to alleviate the suffering of people affected uh, by a crisis. And we also want to grow a data community and bring together everyone who's interested in and use crisis data in their work. So we'd love to see more data from the private sector, from local NGOs, CSOs, anyone who can use the platform uh, is welcome to join and share data. So the center has four focused areas, data services, data responsibility, data literacy, and predictive analytics. I'm going to focus more on data services in this presentation as we directly manage HDX. This is the open platform for data sharing. So the, the goal of HDX is to make humanitarian data easy to find and use for analysis. It was launched in 2014 and has become the go-to place for humanitarian data. You'll find hundreds of organizations sharing data on HDX. Everyone from ACLID sharing conflict data to WFP sharing food prices and so on. So this is a typical layout of a data set page on HDX. I really want to draw your attention to uh, the tabs at the end. So this is showing the same page, but with the, the tab for download on the left and the tab for the metadata on the right. So in the metadata, we make sure that um, you know where the data is coming from. So the source of the data, you know who gave it, who uploaded it to HDX. You can see when it was last updated. So that's really important. So you can see it's the latest data available. You can see when it's next going to be updated. So you can look forward to when that next update comes. And you can see if that data set is public because we also have data sets that might be a little bit sensitive and they're under uh, something called HDX Connect. So you'll see the metadata, but you won't be able to download it until you request that data from the admin of the organization page on HDX. So our team of data managers checks every data set that comes onto the platform. So at a glance, uh, if, I, if we look at HDX, it had 1.4 million unique users last year. Uh, over 1.8 million uh, data sets were downloaded. We have over 300 uh, active organizations on the platform, and those organizations have shared over 19,000 data sets across 250 locations. This shows the, the unique users from 2016, 2021, and here you can see that there was a dramatic increase between 2019 and 2020. And this was due to the, the demand for health data around the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's encouraging to see that, that while the pandemic has peaked, the demand for data has remained strong in 2021. So this is encouraging for the years to come. So when we talk about humanitarian data, what do we actually mean? So it's data about the context of the crisis. It's data about the people affected and their needs and it's data about the humanitarian response. But we're also looking for any type of data that can help in a humanitarian crisis. So we have some private uh, sector data on HDX, but we would welcome more. So I have a question. So while having a large amount of data on HDX is a great achievement for collective action, 
can you name any downsides that this may cause? Um, I think I'll just answer this myself, just to, to, so we keep within the time. So, <laughs> so it can be hard to find the data that you need. So to help users in their quest for good and relevant data, in 2019, the HDX team added a feature called the data grid. So based on user feedback, the data grid places the most important crisis data into six groups. So this collects all the core data needed to, to kind of fully understand uh, a crisis within a country. So, so this one here is just showing uh, the Myanmar example. So you have the six um, groups. So you have affected people, coordination and context, food security and nutrition, geography and infrastructure, uh, health and education, and population and socioeconomic. So to kind of, in order to ensure that humanitarians have the data that that they need to understand a crisis, we'll continue to improve these data grids. So this kind of shows you um, why we have these, uh, the, you'll see the, the blue kind of um, bar charts. So each grid has a data completeness progress bar. So if the data on there is complete, it's marked as dark blue. If it's incomplete, so it, it has some of the criteria, it's light blue. And if it's gray, it shows that the, the data is missing. So for data to be marked as complete, it has to be at the subnational level. It has to be in a, in a commonly used format. So a tabular format like a, an Excel file, no PDFs or reports or anything like that. Um, and it has to be the latest available data. So the data grids, they appear at the top of HDX grid as an ongoing humanitarian response. So a humanitarian response plan. So we have 20, we had 27 last year, and now we have 25 uh, locations in the data grid. So this uh, shows the trend of the overall completeness of the data in the data grids from 2019 to 2021. And it's encouraging to see that the, the amount of like complete data has increased from 54% to 69%, while the, the number um, of countries with no data or missing data has uh, decreased from 25% in 2020 to 11% in 2021. So every year we produce um, the state of open data and this is where we report on the progress in closing data gaps across humanitarian operations. So while the data grid uh, gives you a good overview of what data is available, also just as importantly, it shows you which countries have data gaps. And that helps us to focus our attention on trying to fill those data gaps. So what do these three visual pieces have in common? So when we have uh, very good data, so quality data, it can be used uh, to, to kind of report on a crisis. So you can see here that these three uh, interactive uh, graphics were all produced by were like news brands around the world, and they all took this data uh, from HDX. So this is an example of when you have quality data, you can produce data explorers and dashboards like this example I'm showing here from Ukraine. So this shows, this pulls, all this data is available on HDX and it pulls all these different sources together to create this interactive map. And this shows stuff like you can see that the funding of the crisis, the humanitarian impact, the humanitarian response to date, you can toggle through the different layers to look at IDP estimates, where conf conflict events are happening, the population density, where health facilities are located. So it, it's without the quality data, without the access to open data, we would never be able to create this. So that's kind of the message that I really want to get across. So this is the COVID-19 data explorer. And here you can see also kind of this, the same layout as the Ukraine one. And this one pulls together 60 data sets from 25 different sources, and it covers over 50 countries. And all of this data is available on HDX. So this is another example. So the, 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 the first two are maps, and this is a, a donations tracker or a dashboard. Uh, and this one is for the Ukraine private sector donations tracker. And this, again, is data that's all available on HDX. And um, it just shows you the different type of graphics that we can make. 
uh, if we have access to, to good and quality data. So to finish off, really, I just want to, you know, kind of emphasize that everyone can be a data champion. You know, we can all advocate for open data sharing within our networks. Um, let's try to bring more private sector data onto HDX. I think that's beneficial for everyone. And everyone, I hope, can continue to use and support open data platforms. So, you know, over the years, the center's vision has remained unchanged. It's, it's to create a future where all people involved in the humanitarian crisis have access to the data that they need, when and how they need it, and to make responsible, to make responsible uh, decisions. So let's all work together across the humanitarian development, private sector spaces to build bridges and trust in data sharing. And uh, ultimately, you know, that that's what we need to kind of reach the most vulnerable people across the globe with uh, effective assistance. So thank you very much for listening to me and uh, I'll pass it back to you, uh, Riza. Well, I can take the floor from Frisa right away. Thank you very much, all the speakers, Isaac, Tony, Yusuf, thank you very much. Well, in order to be able to learn about the disasters before they take place, these technologies are advancing and should advance and also some preventive uh, measures uh, can be developed with all these technologies and these are great news and this is music to our ears to hear all these developments now uh, as i announced before associate professor Dr. Murat Tiryakioğlu is here online with us. In all our previous events, we created this discussion environment. As I mentioned, when we're talking about the main goals of the project, one goal is to enhance the dialogue. Uh, so now I'd like to ask the participants, do you have any questions? You can type your questions in the chat box. If you don't want to type what utter, you can also say your questions verbally, depending on our time limits. So that was a technical note on my side. And now I'd like to give the floor to Professor Murat Tiryakiolo. Thank you very much, dear Simai. Hello, everyone. CBI Secretary, I'd like to thank you specifically for giving us the opportunity of working on such an important topic. Well, distinguished guests, you provided very enlightening uh, uh, speeches. You informed us a lot about the new developments and you really enriched the project activities with your nice presentations. As you heard from dear Simai, as uh, uh, of the beginning of this project, we have been providing some trainings uh, 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 and in addition to them uh, we also had a different design uh, uh, mostly based on open discussions so now uh, when i look at the participants and also when i look at the before g team in fact we had very good learning opportunities mutually throughout this process and from the participants we always received very good feedback now we understand that our design of project has been very successful in this regard so this is a high added value project and i'd like to thank cbi for this and i'd like to thank for the kind support so with this good baseline. In fact, we are also getting prepared for better projects in future. Well, distinguished participants, until I uh, start getting your question, also with, the, uh, with my academic curiosity, I would like to start with a few questions of my own. And in the meantime, if the participants will have any questions, as mentioned by Sima, you can raise your hand to ask your question verbally, or you can type your question in the chat box as you like. Now, of course, each topic was quite interesting by its own, but, uh, you know, I'd like to start with the very last presentation, the presentation delivered by dear Anthony Burke. So it was about data, so I, you know, I'm an academician. Well, in our academic studies, we occasionally encounter significant challenges uh, regarding data. And the data that Anthony was speaking about was very specific data, you know, and this data is important for effective response. So I'd like to thank you for, uh, on behalf of all, all humanity, and I congratulate you. I wish to see and hear more of it. Uh, uh, and I... Uh, uh, 
also uh, uh, reiterate our wish for partnership uh, at local level in Turkey. Now, would you please speak about some challenges that you had? You know, different cultures may have different habits of sharing. Uh, so at local level, what challenges did you have in collecting data? So dear Anthony, would you please speak about the challenges? Uh, and especially the business community, local NGOs, activities, professional organizations, what kind of roles do they undertake or can they undertake? Uh, so which ones are more supportive, which ones are more timid? So this is my first question to you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Mr. Burke, did you get the question? Was it clear to you? Uh, Tony, do, do you hear the, the translation? No, no, I don't hear any translation. So that, that was a question to you. Oh. <laughs> um, maybe, can you give me the question in English? <laughs> and, and I'll... I'll answer it. Yeah, we can we can just uh, summarize the question to, yeah, uh, exactly. to for you, but uh, it did. Uh, you will see the translation. The next door breakout rooms in between the reactions and the breakout rooms, there is. Mm. Okay, then like we can just maybe summarize uh, very briefly. Actually, like, uh, so, sorry, so I should switch. Well, if he was able to find the interpretation option, I can also summarize the question. The problem is yeah. that Anthony cannot find the interpretation function. So, uh, since he cannot hear the interpretation, I think we need to summarize it in English on the floor. Or, I don't know, maybe I can continue with the other speakers and we can come back to Tony later on. Yes, that may be better. Okay, I will follow the same order, the reverse order, and the next speaker uh, is uh, dear Isaac. I have a question for you. So technology and their use for humanitarian innovation. That was a very nice project example that you gave dear Isaac, well, especially in the perspective of gender inequality, you gave certain examples. For example, it's already well known uh, during the disasters, women have more vulnerability. And uh, in fact, uh, when you look at the ratios, uh, the, uh, the ratio of uh, technology utilization in women is lower compared to men. So I'd like to ask about, you know, gender inequality. Let's look at from a broader perspective. Let's look at it from a social perspective. So uh, think about the communities which already have a limited access to technologies in general. So I know that you have many project uh, activities and you have a lot of experience, project experience. So what is your strategy? What is your plan? What are your intentions uh, for the communities who already have a limited access to technologies? Uh, in general, these are all the vulnerable communities. So during and after a disaster, when mobile technologies are needed and to be used, this is a very important factor. And you know, the, uh, the least developed uh, communities may have a high vulnerability already. That is why uh, uh, they may be already deprived of technologies and what could be the strategic alternative solution for them? What are you doing for them already? I don't know, maybe you have already been specifically working in certain fields and maybe you already have some experience. So maybe you can give us some anecdotes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, 
just to check if you all can hear me well. My mic is okay. Okay, great. Uh, that's a very, very good question. Um, uh, I'll answer it and give three specific examples on how we've, together with the partners, we've been working to address some of these issues. But the one critical thing to note is we really do not have the luxury of talking about um, use of, of technology without improving access to that technology. So we cannot talk about um, impacted community by a certain disaster used to use mobile phone while we have not improved for them to get access to the device, to the mobile phone. And such then, once the, the access is improved, then we can now cross to the other side to see how best we can support them to make use of the technology that's been enabled, enabled by these devices. Um, I'll give um, three examples. The one that I've, I saw and witnessed was during the 2014, 2015, South Sudanese um, influx of migrant affected by the war in South Sudan into Uganda. The area whereby there were Okay, where the government allowed them to settle, uh, it's called Bidibidi. This was a hard to reach area. Um, business, mobile network operators did not have any market incentive to be operational in those areas because it did not have a clear business case and no return on revenue for them because A, the population are poor, they're refugees and so on and so forth. One initiative that one of the mobile network operators in Uganda, together with one of the United Nations agency took, was to me one of the best case, case use cases that we can try to replicate through this collaborative and working together. The UN agency through a donor's grant supported seed funding for the mobile network operator to increase network coverage to the location where over 1 million of the refugees South Sudanese had moved to. Now, the flip of the side of the coin on that is that there was access to connectivity. Once there is access to the network coverage, then you can rest assured access to devices will in one way or another happen. Once access to devices happens, then the mobile network operator or the business partner will be able to cater for their operation cost because the investment were driven from both partners. What that made sure to focus on was that the impacted community were included through connectivity within the Uganda ways of work. Jobs were created, humanitarian operations were able to set up their offices there, mobile network operator were able to set the kiosk and sell the Literally the economy of the area Said. And the seed here was opening up the network coverage. The mobile network operator did not see a business case to open because there's no market to tap in. But because of that partnership between them and the humanitarian partner, the rest of the community did benefit from that. That's one. The second one that I've noticed is through one of our partners in various countries from Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, they do unconditional cash distribution as a way of their cash uh, assistance to humanitarian needs. I, they let the impacted household decide what's good for their family. In most cases, the head of the household, as I said before, are women in this community. They know that my family of five children plus my husband, what we need is to pay school fees out of this money. Me as a head of the household, the woman, I need to start a small business so that I can keep that resilience going, keep the money coming. Uh, my husband, we can rent a plot of land whereby he can start digging and planting cassava. Therefore, through putting the impacted person in the center of making decisions for their own lives, you address, they're able to address nearly five different sector focus. 
But what really impressed me when I had a field visit with them is during the registration vulnerability targeting process, they realize which household does not have a mobile device, which household has a mobile device. For the household that does not have a mobile device, they include a basic feature fund included in the donation packet. So A, they enable that person to already get financial inclusion, access to financial, but also digital literacy. They train them if, if they're not, they don't know how to use mobile, how to use just the basic functionality. I call this the aid approach of 21, 21st century. Uh, I think we within the humanitarian sector, and again, I cannot uh, all the work that CBI is doing enough. We need to learn that A, some of these approaches are there. Communities need just to be impacted. Those who are stricken by poverty are actually quite good decision makers because they know how to budget and survive on $10 a month better than the rest of us. And therefore, the more we empower the community that we serve in, the better some of what we're discussing today become easier to implement because the person that's impacted is at the center of the circle. And finally, from GSMA point of view, I spoke about the innovation fund approach that we have. And this is to enable uh, local small business, startup business to innovate for solutions that are much relevant within the context where they live. The uptake of that and the resilience of that then becomes much more easier um, uh, to, to replicate or even scale up. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. In fact, in the answer to my question, uh, you made many links to many other factors. Um, for example, I live in Afyon province of Turkey. This uh, province is close to Ankara in terms of distance. And uh, in fact, Afyon uh, has always been a satellite city for the refugees, even before the Syrian crisis. And in fact, migration economy is also an area that uh, I'm interested in as an academician. So I have been making some observations. Well, uh, in order for the uh, refugees to continue their basic uh, uh, life, in fact, uh, they say that the mobile devices were a basic need for themselves. They, would not change this for another item because you know uh, this is what uh, connects them to the rest of the world uh, commercially and also in terms of information access for example when they would like to get some information about the uh, uh, human traffickers they also use this device so uh, regardless of the type or size of the crisis mobile technologies are an indispensable part of our lives uh, so a bed, some warm bath, you know, you can just drop them and you can just choose and get the mobile device because it may bring you more welfare. Also, dear Isaac, you gave an example about a different type of uh, micro credit. So the Mohamed Yunus uh, de designed this in order to improve uh, economic sustainability and quality, for, quality of life at micro scale. That was a very nice example. In order to uh, eliminate inequalities, connectivity is a very important factor uh, to scale it up. You know, uh, it's a critical example. I hope in future it will be possible to collaborate more because Turkey has been hosting the highest number of refugees uh, uh, and uh, we have a higher awareness about uh, uh, disaster vulnerabilities, and we are vulnerable. Thank you. I hope we can collaborate more. Now, I would like to continue with our other speaker, dear Yusuf Said Gündoğdu. Still in the chat box, I don't see any questions. Maybe I will again raise one of my questions. So, dear Yusuf Gündoğdu, I would like to thank you very much for your presentation. We saw a local example, a, a city hospital from Eskişehir, where you installed the uh, base isolator. So it is very promising to see that these examples are getting widespread and for uh, retrofitting the infrastructure of critical facilities. I was thinking that the advancements are coming a, a bit slowly, but now I would like to ask you a question at a at macro level. 
So uh, after listening to your presentation and uh, with knowing that uh, in specific areas you are operational, I would like to learn about your ideas about the differences uh, in the understanding between different communities. So think about the risk management process. You talked about an innovative approach, but what are the differences in understanding this new approach among different communities? You are muted, Mr. Yusuf Gündoğdu. Okay, I unmuted myself. Well, you have touched upon a very important point. If I understand you correctly, you are asking the following. So the communities uh, uh, who face the earthquake risk more and less, less. And in, in mitigation of disaster risk, is there any difference in the approaches? And what are my observations? I think that was your question. Well, let me answer. Since uh, uh, 2008, we have been operational in Istanbul. This is our 14th year. But, you know, uh, globally, uh, uh, we have presence in Japan, California, and other locations with a high uh, earthquake risk. Well, in fact, the comparison would be very meaningful, really. I can split your question into two. For example, the actions to be taken after an earthquake and also the measures to be taken before an earthquake. So in one category of countries, you see the second question is more important. For example, uh, some countries uh, are more focused on the post-earthquake measures. Uh, but in the other group of countries, for example, uh, which uh, experience earthquakes more, just like Japan and California, these communities are more proactive. And in fact, before the problem arises, they are inclined to take the measure. They don't wait uh, for the damage to be inflicted, inflicted upon the structure. In fact, this is not the whole problem that they see. They would like to eliminate economic losses as well. And they uh, are interested in the whole infrastructure, I mean, utilities, uh, for example, transportation, utilities, uh, just like electric transmission lines, uh, fuel transmission lines all the infrastructure systems that are critical and vital for life you know these are critical for those uh, countries in this category so in the category of countries which are more experienced about uh, earthquakes they are more proactive and you can see the the repercussions and reflections of this in the legislation and regulations so their regulatory authorities in fact, uh, I've already come to an agreement about this approach. For example, uh, in the US, uh, there is the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, FEMA. In Japan, uh, they, uh, there is an equivalent authority. You see, the authorities are there in those countries. And uh, they have certain publications. They have their own specifications. And in Turkey, there is an equivalent authority. It is AFA, Disaster Management Authority of Turkey. It's uh, recently a new authority. So it cannot be as proactive as FEMA uh, because it's, it also depends on how developed the country is. So FEMA has been there and present since 1950s and 60s, so it is almost 70 or 80 years old. But the Turkish AFAD is almost 15 years old, if I'm not wrong. So 
uh, in Turkey also as a community, we have less experience about earthquakes. So we are mostly focused on post-earthquake measures. For example, assembly points, post-earthquake responses, how to deal with the injured and the casualties, how to transfer them. Well, I also should say that we are very good at these points. I don't criticize uh, uh, anyone. So we have seen the operations of Afat in one earthquake and also especially during a lesser earthquake, we need to congratulate them for their operations success. Of course, I don't know how much time uh, I have, maybe I got too much of your time, but uh, especially in a lesser earthquake, in fact, they used uh, drones unmanned aerial vehicles at night and they were able to identify how many buildings uh, were destroyed and uh, 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 which buildings in fact uh, should be abandoned uh, uh, right away so the team the rescue teams were able to uh, you know respond very quickly and also likewise in one earthquake Candelia observatory uh, uh, had a very good and relevant and close estimation. And in fact, with, based on this estimation, many construction machines from Istanbul, in fact, uh, departed the town to go to Van, and they were there timely to help the people of one province. So yes, we got specialized in uh, earthquake responses, but still there are many things to do on the other side. Thank you. In 2009, in fact, uh, Afat got its institutional uh, structure. Uh, uh, civil defense provincial directors were brought under one umbrella then. And then uh, there were some institutional changes, bureaucratic changes. First, it was an autonomous unit affiliated to the prime ministry, but then it transformed into a unit under the Ministry of Interior. Well, in fact, that was a process of institutionalization, but it was slowed down with all these different steps. And also, you know, when you look at their mandate, uh, in fact, uh, the chemical threats, earth quakes, the cats in the trees, they deal with everything. Well, we prepared a sector vulnerability uh, report uh, uh, in relation to Istanbul earthquake. We also underlined in this report that, yes, uh, we are quite efficient in terms of post-disaster uh, responses because we are a disaster country. However, about capacity building and awareness raising, I agree with you, we still need to make some way. I hope without too many beautiful memories, we will be able to make some progress. I think with the efficient coordination of B4G, Vic Tony got the question uh, somehow. So uh, I'd like to repeat it anyway. So Tony, thank you very much. I congratulate you for your successful work. Data is a very critical topic. Uh, I hope it will be possible for us to collaborate in Turkey as well, because this is also important for academicians like us. So you collect data in multiple aspects, in multiple dimensions uh, related to uh, humanitarian assistance. But what are the cultural differences that you see locally? So some... Uh, NGOs may be more active. So can you just give a few examples, just some anecdotes very shortly. I know uh, the time is already up. So would you just provide us an overview? Yeah, sure. And uh, apologies uh, for, the, for the translation issues earlier. So some of the challenges faced by local uh, organizations, uh, when, when you have uh, data that's so granular in detail, so uh, the issue kind of of data sensitivity comes into play. Um, so we check every data set that comes onto HDX. So if we get assessment data or survey data from a local organization, you know, quite often it would contain information about, you know, um, contact details of a person or um, kind of just information that would put them at risk. So, so we do a robust uh, quality assurance of every data set that comes on. And we also provide trainings um, and we set up calls with uh, 
uh, any any organization that joins HDX to just talk them through, you know, some of the things around data sensitivity and, and just how to, you know, kind of have tidier data and, and how to format it. We'll help them to to upload it to the site. We'll, we'll show them how to fill out the metadata. And uh, so, so we provide that kind of uh, trainings and guidance uh, to any organization, be it local or at the national level. Um, another thing is, uh, you know, local organizations, you know, they might not have the access or the capacity to collect, analyze and maintain data. So this too is where HDX can support, you know, we're, we're free and open for anyone to join. Huh? You know, if they have any type of data that we think can improve a humanitarian response, then we're more than welcome uh, them to join, to get in contact with us. And we can, you know, kind of go through the steps with them to make sure that that data is, is uh, would improve the lives and not make, uh, put anybody at risk. So that that's kind of the, the big uh, point I want to make there. Over. Well, in fact, we got an automatic invitation for collaboration. Uh, thank you very much for your response. I hope uh, that will be a good opportunity for future cooperation. Well, as far as I see, we didn't receive any further questions from the participants and we have exceeded our time by about 12 minutes. Uh, so I'd like to give you the floor, dear Simai, uh, to announce the last uh, session. I'd like to thank once again to dear speakers for uh, their inspiring speeches. Thank you on behalf of U4G and all the participants. Thank you very much, dear Professor Murat. I'd like to thank you uh, for asking all those questions in order to elaborate uh, these topics. I will be very short and I would like to give the floor to Connective Business Initiative Program Coordinator, Mr. Kerim Albayar, for the closing remarks. Kerim, can you hear us? Yes, I can, and I hope you can hear me as well. You can, okay, wonderful. Well, again, uh, I've already been introduced. I'm the Program Coordinator for the Connecting Business Initiative, and I'm very pleased to be here today. I hope that all of you found today's presentations as useful and educational as I did. I, I certainly learned a lot myself, and I'm very grateful to all of our speakers for sharing their very useful and interesting presentations. I also want to thank Sime and Irem from the Business for Goals platform for convening this event today. Riza for being an excellent co-host as always. Yusuf from Miyamoto, Isaac from GSMA, Anthony from HDX, and Dr. Murad from the Business and Climate Resilience Project. And of course, our translators who I'm sure are working very hard today and I'll try and slow down in my speech to make that a little bit easier for you. As has been mentioned, CBI or the Connecting Business Initiative was established to strategically engage with the private sector before, during, and after emergencies. And it's really important from our perspective that there be that strategic relationship between the United Nations and the international humanitarian and development system and the private sector. In Turkey, as in every country in the world, the government has the primary responsibility during an emergency. However, all of us firmly believe that the entirety of society benefits when we're able to leverage the resources, the skills, the capacities and the expertise of the private sector. CBI is today a global network of chambers of commerce, associations, business federations, and other partners in 13 countries, including one regional network for the Pacific, but we're rapidly expanding around the world and we're hoping to leverage the lessons learned from companies around the world and CBI member networks around the world so that we can share that information, best practices, and really improve uh, the procedures and processes that we have in place. We heard today about a lot of different tools, a lot of different ideas, including hard infrastructure and engineering interventions and critical sector involvement, such as MNOs from the, the mobile network operators. We heard a lot about data literacy and the power of data and sharing of data to make humanitarian response more effective and efficient and prepare for emergencies. And all of these tools rely on trust and willingness to cooperate. And I think that's really the role of CBI Turkey to be that conduit. We're very committed to supporting our partners in Turkey, Turkonfed and the Business for Goals platform. 
We really look forward to working with you and your members on concrete activities coming out of this session, particularly the practical application and innovate of the practical application and use of technology and innovation in disaster management. And we'll think about how we can do that together with Business for Goals and with Turconfed. We want to ensure that we can strengthen the resilience of businesses. In doing so, we are able to strengthen and support business suppliers, their employees, their customers. And when we prepare for disasters and know what to do and who to call before the emergency strikes, all of us benefit, all of us are better off. So for my part, as the program coordinator of CBI, I really look forward to taking some of the ideas that we've learned here today, working with some of the companies that are on the line here, and of course with CBI Turkey, to implement some new ideas and approaches. I should also mention that we're very pleased to be joining CBI Turkey in Ankara to understand better how we can support Business for Goals, Turkonfed, and UNDP and OCHA in Turkey when it comes to how we, the business community, the private sector can be involved in disaster and climate resilience and really strengthening the relationships between the business community, the government, international organizations, civil society, and many other stakeholders. So I'll try to stay brief because I know we're a little bit over time, but for my part, Tushekor, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here with you today and looking forward to seeing you again soon. Over to you, Simai. Thank you very much, dear Kerim. Thank you very much for these nice remarks. I would like to be very short too. So I'd like to thank everyone who was here today with us. So with our new initiatives, we'll meet again very soon. And that's the end of the session.